We all have something or some things that give us trouble. Things maybe from our past, maybe things we were raised with that cause us to view life, activity, all of these different things differently than others will. And that means there are things that bother us, maybe things that bother us with other people. When I was growing up, let's see, I heard people preach against television. I heard people preach against drinking, against smoking, against going to the bowling alley, against dancing, against playing cards, against, and you get the point, we could go on with that list. Some of you might chuckle at some of those things. Others, you might go, well, that's a problem. I'm just using this to illustrate everybody out there has some issues, some things that really are problems. And how we handle those in the body of Christ can either promote unity or break it apart, ruin it, and cause problems. And we're going to look at that today. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and we are looking at what it takes biblically for us to get along. Yes, we know the scriptures encourage us to get along, but how is that even possible? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning here, the Apostle Paul is going to deal with a problem that goes on among believers in Corinth. It's not a problem we particularly have problems with today. There's not many of us that are worried about food sacrifice to idols because, well, most of us don't live in places where people are sacrificing to an idol and they're there eating the food that comes from that particular sacrifice. We might find counterparts to this in modern culture, but nothing precisely in this vein. This does not mean that there are not believers in other parts of the world where they're actually killing animals, sacrificing them, and, and then eating the meat as part of a sacrificial system. So Paul brings this issue up in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8, now about food sacrificed idols, or about literally about idol sacrifices. We know that we all have knowledge. And by knowledge, he's talking about knowledge that involves experience. We've learned something and we've interacted with others. Knowledge, he says, puffs up, but love builds up. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this statement here. And I've heard people say, you shouldn't study the Bible too much. You shouldn't learn too much. You shouldn't work too hard because knowledge puffs up. But I think they're missing the point of the context is, is that we all have knowledge. And sometimes we have learned something about the Christian life that should positively affect us. But we can develop a, a big head thinking, well, I know this. And what's the problem with you? you, you you're you still stuck with that? And I remember having a pastor I was talking with at a conference. And we were talking about some people that happened to be in our church that this pastor knew. And I said, well, they, they, they have this issue right now they're, they're dealing with. And the pastor goes, oh, do you guys still worry about that where you are? <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I could think it, it is an issue for them, though. And we're not just going to run over them and leave footprints over the top of their, their face and their head. We're, we're going to try to treat them carefully. We want them to grow. And so he says, knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. In other words, he's not really saying to avoid knowledge. What he's saying is you need to exercise love to actually be building people up. Verse 2, if anyone thinks that he knows or experientially knows anything, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, then he is actually interestingly known by him, that is known by God. The point being, God's, and this goes back to something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, God's more concerned about our actions than just our knowledge. We can go around and we can spew knowledge and we can give correct doctrine. We can articulate it correctly out of our mouth. But Paul says, I want to know the power, not the words. Now, it's not that Paul isn't concerned with words. We know from Paul's writings that he is concerned about words. But sometimes we are all about what we know and what we can say. And we're really weak on how we actually live that out in the kindness and care that we can show for other believers. And so he says, love, love, that's what, that's where God, that's where God knows you. 
is in this matter of love, when you're really demonstrating real love for the, for the saints. Verse 4, about eating then these foods, these foods sacrificed to idols then, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. See, this is the basis of, of our knowledge as believers. They're nothing. And that there is no God but one. There's only one true God. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and there are, the Bible refers to those, those spirit beings, it calls them gods, but they're created by God, and they're not really genuinely gods, they're just more powerful than us. As there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, referring to the Father in this context, all things are from him and we exist for him, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, all things are through him and we exist through him. He's not saying here Jesus is not God. Lord was the term that they most commonly referred to Jesus Christ to distinguish him from the Father. But we have also a number of places where Paul himself refers to Jesus Christ as God. That's, that's an aside here. But what he's saying is, we know that there's only one God. And why would he bother with calling Jesus Christ Lord if this was also not another designation that they used to refer to God? Because what he's saying is, in reality, there's only really one God. In this case, it happens to be the Father and Jesus Christ. The Spirit's also there, but he's not the, the, the point of contention here. And so these idols and these things that they sacrifice to, they're not genuinely gods. So verse 7, but everyone, or however, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to or accustomed to idolatry. It's part of their idolatry right up until now, that when they eat food sacrificed to idols, their conscience being weak. Why is it weak? Because they haven't really learned to practice biblical truth up yet up to this point, or at least biblical truth related to this problem, and they are therefore defiled. They stain it up. They, they rest, muss up in, uh, their, their conscience. Food, he says, is not going to bring us closer or commend us to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we're no better off if we do eat. In other words, eating doesn't change our relationship with God. This is what Paul's trying to get at. But be careful that this, that this right, this authority that you have of yours, is no way becomes then a stumbling block for another. And this word stumbling block, the other day we had one uh, scandalizo that had to do with with. It, putting something in the path that impeded their progress. This particular term that he uses over here actually meant to cut in front of, causing them to trip and stumble or fall. Therefore, stumbling block really is a very appropriate way of handling this particular word. And it's a stumbling block to those that are weak. In other words, those that haven't really matured in their Christian faith. And they realize, and I would say uh, a good point, that they haven't that they haven't yet fully come to appreciate is that statement that Paul makes at the end of Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, that there is absolutely nothing that can separate the believer from God's love to us in Christ Jesus. We could go back up a few verses there in Romans 8 where it says there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. So, but that's a truth that there are believers that might hear that verse. They might say, I'd like to believe that, but they struggle with these things and they're afraid that maybe eating meat offered to idols might cause a problem. And by the way, this whole issue comes up again in Romans where Paul made this very statement about nothing can separate us. Verse 10, for if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, so you're, you have knowledge, you have, these idols are nothing. This is, they're foolish people worshiping demons. They're nothing. It's just, it's, it's good meat. I'm going to stop in here and I'm going to have a bite of this meat, and I'm not connected with these demons and idols in any way. So they see you dining then or eating in an idol's table, temple. Won't his weak conscience be encouraged or built up? Now, this is an important word, building up, but here it's being used negatively. It's built up to eat food offered to idols. In other words, they're doing this because he says, so the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, comes to ruin by your knowledge. In other words, they see you doing it and they say, well, you're more mature, they're more mature than me, so I guess I can go in there and do that. But they're not doing it, as Paul will say at the end of Romans 14, they're not doing it from faith. And so they're having a problem. They do it because you're doing it, not because they believe God is okay and it's not going to in any way infringe upon, destroy, ruin, however we want to describe it, their relationship to God. Verse 12, and I think this is a very important statement. He says, now when you sin, 
like this against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience. You are sinning against Christ. Remember Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. First thing he says to Paul is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul's activity against the body of Christ, against the church, Christ took that personally. He shared in what those believers down there were suffering. He didn't sit aloof of it up there in heaven going, I don't feel anything. No, he shared in that suffering as believers. And therefore, as Paul is looking at this here, he says, when you sin against a brother, by really encouraging him to do something he's not ready to do, you are sinning against Christ. Does that show you the seriousness of it? Therefore, if food, he says, causes my brother or sister to stumble or fall, I will never again eat meat or I will not eat meat into the age so that I will not cause my brother or sister to stumble. To be, And this here is this word stumble is our word scandalizo, which means it impedes their progress. They're growing and all of a sudden that growth is impeded by my actions. And Paul says, I don't want my actions to impede there, so I'm just not going to eat meat around them. I love meat. It's hard to imagine giving that up. But Paul says, you know what? Do you have love for that brother and sister? Or do you love the meat more? <laughs> well, he doesn't actually say that, but above in the context, what did he say? Love is the better thing. And Paul's actually going to go over this into chapter 9, where he says, I'm an apostle, I'm free, I, I, am I not? And, and I have the ability, one of the things he says, are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, because you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And my defense to those who examine me is, do we not have the right, notice this, the authority, Paul says, to eat and drink? Don't we have the authority to be accompanied by a believing wife or a sister wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I have no authority to refrain from working? See, Paul says, we could demand of you that you take care of us. Apparently, the other apostles expected it. Not that they necessarily went into town and passed the hat and said, hey, pay my bills. But they didn't have a problem with the churches helping them. Paul and Barnabas chose to forego. We know we saw this the other day because Paul says, I didn't want to burden you. I wanted you to be persuaded. We were here simply looking out for what's best for you, not because, well, hopefully before we left town, you were going to provide something for us. But Paul says we had the authority. The others had the authority. We could have done that. We could have done this. And not only just taking care of them, but also, as he said, even as they traveled with a wife. Church history tells us Peter traveled with his wife and a daughter. Church history tells us. Um, they, he, had, he and his wife had one daughter, and she traveled with them as they traveled around the uh, working with churches. Anyway, it says, who serves? Who serves as a soldier? At his own expense. In other words, if you, you sign up as a soldier, you don't you don't pay your own wages. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat from the fruit? Or who shepherds a flock and does not drink the milk from the flock? In other words, he's just giving some real world, world examples that, yeah, people took care of them. But Paul says, I'm saying these things from a man's values, the way man looks at these things. He says, didn't even the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Paul uses a similar example over in 1 Timothy 5. I'm still trying to get to the main point here. Is God really concerned about the oxen? Well, he isn't really saying it for our sake. Uh, yes, this is written for our sake, because he who plows ought to plow in hope, and he who threshes should thresh in hope, sharing the crop. We might come to this, and, I, and, I, and I've done this teaching on this, just biblically what's said here. I don't go to this especially to say I want people to give. We don't, I don't do giving series in our church uh, like that. Um, because I don't, I don't expect the people in the church to pay my bills. That doesn't mean that they don't. That doesn't mean they reach out. It doesn't mean that they don't tell me. They themselves tell me what, where I would be with this. Anyway, all that to say, Paul says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we reap material benefits from you? If others have this right or this authority to receive benefits from you, well, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. So Paul's using himself as an example, saying, 
We take care of ourselves because we don't want anything to get in the way of the gospel. He's not saying those other guys were wrong or bad. He's just saying, this is what, this is my motivation. This is the way I do it. So uh, he's going to go on. He's going to give some other examples. And I want to move on down here to the context where we, where we get this, because there are some other statements in here that just continue this. And he says, for my part, I have used none of these rights, nor have I written these things that they may be applied in my case, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should deprive me of my boast. For if I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I, I have no reason to boast because I'm compelled to preach and woe to me if I do not preach then the gospel. For if I do this willingly, then I have reward. But if it's unwilling, if it's forced upon me, then I am entrusted with a commission. And he was entrusted with a commission. God commissioned him to carry this out. Verse 18, what then is my reward? To preach the gospel and offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel. Paul says, that's my boast. I have to preach the gospel because God commissioned me to do that. But I, he says, have chosen to do this without charging anybody. Verse 19, although I am free from all. So Paul says, I'm free from you guys because I'm not making you owe me anything. And you're going, okay, I thought this all started talking about eating meat offered to idols and such. How, how does this come back around? Here we go now. Although I'm free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave, or literally it's a, the verb form, I slave uh, to, to everyone in order to win more. To the Jew, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, like those one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those who are under law. To those who are without law, like one without law, though I am not without law, without law, or God's law they've added here. I'm not law, literally, I'm not lawless towards God, but under the law of Christ, which would be the law of love, to win those that are lawless. To the weak I became weak. See, there's those people that have problems of thing. I became weak to them. In other words, if I'm around those people, I'm not going to flaunt the fact that I can eat whatever I want in order that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Now, I believe when he's talking about this, because he brings weak in here, and if we work backwards, I don't think he's saying particularly that this is the way he evangelized the unsaved. I think what Paul's saying here is, this is the way I'm trying to win these people to biblical truth. So I'm going to deal with people that are under the law, and when I'm dealing with them under, biblic under the law, I'm not going to come and run roughshod over their conscience. And I'm not going to I'm do the same thing with lawless people. I'm not going to be fussy and... and, and Oh, well, you guys shouldn't do that because uh, he says, I didn't do that with them either. And when I'm around those that are weak, I'm careful with them. I think all of these things are showing first and foremost in this context that this is how Paul deals with believers. Did he deal some of this with, with unbelievers when he's trying to win them to, to salvation by the gospel? Well, yeah, I, I believe so. But here's the point now, coming down to this. Paul at the end of chapter 8 said, I, I, I won't eat meat if it causes a problem to my brother, because I want them to grow. And you know, if they grow, then that problem becomes a non-problem. It's not an issue anymore. It's, all, it's gone. But over here, he's really indicating how it is. And this is a hard thing for us as believers to deal with, that what Paul is saying is, when you're around these different kinds of people, well, be like them in the way that you react to things. That doesn't mean if you got some people that are loud mouth cussers and drinkers and such that you have to participate in that, but you don't put up a big fuss going, oh, you guys, that's horrible. Oh, that's not what he's talking about. He's just saying, I don't fuss over things when I'm around those lawless people. And when I'm around the, the, those people in the law, I, I fuss a little bit about kosher and I fuss a little bit about those things just so I don't cause trouble to them at that moment in time. And when I'm dealing with weak, well, I... I, I be like a weak person. I, I function like a weak person. He doesn't turn himself into a weak person. He just functions weak for their benefit, that his actions might not get in the way. Paul is more concerned about his brother in Christ than that he comes out being right or gets to do what he wants to do. And the essence of what Paul's getting at here is that's 
one chief way of dealing with controversial, questionable things is just to be that person that's willing to give up their right for the benefit of that other believer. A hard thing sometimes for us to swallow because most of us, we've got things we don't want to give up. We also know there's things that have bothered us and we kind of wish that those other people that cause us a little bit of pain or make us nervous or upset by things that they've done, we kind of wish that they would cease and desist from that activity. Well, if we think that of them, then likewise, we ought to maybe think that about our own activities for the sake of other believers. And he's doing this because he realizes God's commissioned him for this. And likewise, we ought to all see ourselves as God's given us a gift. We're to be serving that gift towards other believers. And how are you going to be able to serve that gift to other believers if your actions in the general sphere of life are coming across as being real offensive because of issues that they maybe have. And it, they may have to grow out of those issues, but you as a believer can put your things aside so that you can better love and serve those believers. I know it's been a little long video again, but I really thought it was kind of important to put both these sections together because they're all part of one thing. And, and, uh, the first part of this where Paul's saying, I forgo, I forgo getting paid. I have the right to get paid, but I forgo that. He says, I'm doing that. I'm using that as an illustration to say, I'm more concerned about you than something I can get out of it. This is his point. This is his point. And I think it's very important for us to understand that we ought to live that same way as we relate to brothers and sisters in Christ. So with that, I encourage you to be thinking about your brothers and sisters in Christ and how to be a help, not a hindrance. Have a good day in the Lord. And as I say every day, I do thank you for joining me.